We are live now. We will start just chapter one. Assalamu alaikum. Patakshua Jashi Muddin to Moshimas Tanaka Sensei to Sensei Nihono Minasabani Kiwa Yurushi Konegashimas. Patakshua Wolfakadaiga today. Kokusai Tokyo Sesakuno Hakushikuno Hakushigo O Shutukushimasta. Nihonua Watashini Tote Dai Nino Furusato des. だから日本のこと大事にしてます。今でも心と心の絆がつながってます。よろしくお願いします。I say a few words in Japanese to welcome our Japanese friends. Today's keynote speaker, Professor Tanaka, the guest of honor, His Excellency Ambassador Ito, uh, the uh, High Commissioner from uh, Sri Lanka, His Excellency, the Chair of the Session, Professor Atikulistan, the Vice Chancellor of North South University, distinguished guest, and our loving students from North South University. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. The topic of uh, today's lecture is crucial for us for the future development and peace of Bangladesh and the literals of the Bay of Bengal. Our goal is to be a developed country by 2041. Only 23 years are left, and we need to make per capita income more than 12,000 US dollar, which is not an uh, easy task. It's, it's actually an enormous task. Without exploring the huge seabed resources, including gas and oil that we have in the Bay of Bengal, the task will be really difficult. A prominent scholar narrated that the water of the Indian Ocean will determine the fate of the nation in the 21st century. The gravity of power shifting from Europe to Asia Pacific to uh, the India uh, in the Pacific region, um, it is evident. The IR and the security experts are aware that uh, this 21st century is known as this uh, uh, century of Asia or Asian century because of the rise of China, Japan, India, and the literal of the Bay of Bengal, including Bangladesh. Um, according to British Petroleum Statistical Review of World Energy, approximately 100 trillion cubic feet of unexplored oil and gas reserves are located along the coast of Myanmar, Bangladesh, and India. Moreover, for the security of the sea lands, the, the Bay of Bengal remains an area for a strategic uh, competition between the rising powers. So peace and stability in the Bay of Bengal are fundamental for our development. Unhealthy competition or conflict for some gains rather than a winning situation will not help us or anyone uh, 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 in, this, in this region. Under this milieu, it is important for us to learn and assess the challenges and opportunities we have in the Bay of Bengal. We'll hear from our keynote speaker, a prominent Japanese professor about the Bay of Bengal, its history, its potential, and how uh, it can contribute to peace and development uh, uh, for Bangladesh and in the region. Just a few words about Japan. Japan has been the largest development partner of Bangladesh since uh, the independence of Bangladesh. Japan is a trusted friend of Bangladesh. And uh, during my stay in Japan, I found Japanese people very friendly to Bangladesh and its people. It is uh, interesting to know that Japan has already emerged as the largest market of for export in 2014 to which is a good sign. So there is no doubt that Japan is a role model for many nations. The people of this country proves that not only the size, but of the weight of a state matters in the international arena. Our audience is eager to know the challenges and options for Bangladesh in the Bay of Bengal and Japan's perspective uh, in this regard, in particular how Japan can contribute to the further development of Bangladesh. At this stage, I would like to request Professor Tofik, the director 
of South Asian Institute for Policy and Governance and Chairman of the Department of Political Science and Sociology to deliver uh, his speech. Professor Profik, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jushim. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and good day to everyone. It is a great uh, uh, to have you all in today's lecture program of Professor Tanaka Akuhito on connectivity in the Bay of Bengal area, challenges and options for Bangladesh. This program has been jointly organized by the South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance of North South University and the Embassy of Japan. I'm Professor Hawk, Director of SIPG, extend a special welcome to Professor Tanaka Akihito, President, National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, GRIPS, for being the keynote speaker of today's program. I warmly welcome our guest of honor, His Excellency Ambassador Hito Naoki, Ambassador of Japan to Bangladesh, is Chair of the Session, Professor Atikul Islam, Vice Chancellor of North South University, Discussant Ambassador Shoidul Haq, Professorial Fellow SIPG NSU, and former Foreign Secretary, Government of Bangladesh. And also all the distinguished audience, diplomats, Japanese delegates, faculty members, participants, uh, students, and media representatives in this forum. Bangladesh being a country of 160 million people, only recognized the importance of its southern sector after the Shumudra region, uh, basically, which is uh, victory in the Marine domain. And the country's delimitation of uh, disputed maritime boundary with India and Myanmar. After the two verdicts of International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea and Permanent Court of Arbitration with Myanmar and India in March 2012 and July 2014, respectively, Bangladesh obtained this absolute maritime, maritime territory of uh, 1 lakh 18,813 square kilometers, 200 nautical miles of uh, exclusive economic zone, and an additional area of continental shelf uh, from the coast. We are so happy to see that uh, 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 we have this, uh, uh, the architect of this whole uh, maritime legal battle, Khurshid uh, Alok, is within us, and I hope that you will also be contributing uh, in this uh, uh, today's session. Thank you for joining. The benefits of blue or marine economy can be seen in the form of a development paradigm in the terms of increasing poverty, increasing employment opportunities, increasing foreign exchange earnings, and developing relevant economic infrastructure. Exploration and exploitation of huge oceanic resources from the Bay of Bengal can bring prosperity for the country. The reemergence of the Bay of Bengal in internal strategic calculus has immense geopolitical consequences. Emerging geopolitical changes in the Bay of Bengal region are unleashing its economic and strategic potential. Under the current global economic power shift toward the Indo-Pacific Ocean region, this geo geographical advantage of Bangladesh would provide a unique opportunity for the country to play a note and half role in regional as well as the regional matters. Let me now talk a little bit about the South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance of North South University. The SIPG of North South University is the one and only and the pioneering institute with a regional focus in Bangladesh. SIPG is also doing research, holding dialogues, and working on various geopolitical issues in South Asia and beyond from academic and research points of view. In this connection, I'm happy to inform you that SIPG has earlier conducted various webinars, seminars, conferences, and certificate courses on various geopolitical issues. For example, we just had a uh, very interesting and timely webinar 25th of August, uh, on remembering the Rohingya genocide of 2017, uh, waiting for justice. Uh, 9th of this month, we also had a interesting discussion uh, panel on current Afghan situation in Bangladesh. In last one year, we had other uh, kind of uh, webinars and seminars on Israel's atrocity against the Palestinians. Uh, another was military coup in Myanmar, impacts on the Rohingya crisis, and also like RCEP, the Regional Co Comprehensive Economic Partnership, challenges and options for them. So these are the kind of the things we are regularly organizing. And also SIPG 
is now conducting several certificate courses related with uh, geopolitics and uh, kind of a humanitarian assistance and other issues. Our first certificate course that we uh, completed within this year was humanitarianism, policy and diplomacy. And we are very, we were very happy that uh, Ambassador Juto was one of our resource persons joining there. The second certificate course we are now running on Rohingya crisis. And the third one that coming in this year will be on peace, pandemic, development and geopolitics, Asia. And Asia. So we have some upcoming events that I just want to uh, share with you before I conclude my remarks. We have an international conference in next uh, uh, November 12 to 14 on preparing public leaders in South Asia for a post-pandemic world. And also we have planned for a uh, international two-day international conference on geopolitics and strategic shifts in South Asia in early 2020. So with that note and information, lastly, I thank you all again for joining and now hand over the program to the Petrushin moderator. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Tofik, for your uh, wonderful remarks. Uh, uh, before I uh, invite Professor Tanaka, uh, Rudmila, would you please share uh, uh, the Google form to get the feedback from the audience? Uh, I humbly request all the participants uh, to fill uh, the Google form shared in the chat box. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, you can choose yes or no options. Uh, you don't take uh, uh, more than a couple of minutes. Uh, this is a humble request from the Embassy of Japan. So I humbly request all the participants uh, to click the link and just, uh, uh, you know, uh, see the question and then submit it. Thank you very much. So now <clears throat> um, I would like to request uh, Professor uh, Akihiko Tanaka the president of the National Graduate Institute of Policy Studies, in short briefs, uh, uh, to deliver his speech. Before assuming the current position, he had been professor of international politics at the Institute for Advanced Studies on Asia, the University of Tokyo for many years. He served as president of uh, JICA from April 2012 to September 2015. Professor Tanaka was also executive vice president of the University of Tokyo from 2009 to 2011. He's chairman of the board Japan for UNA Share and a distinguished fellow at the JICA Research Institute. He obtained his bachelor's degree in international relations at the University of Tokyo in 1977 and PhD in political science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1981. He has numerous books and um, articles on world politics and security issues in Japanese and English, including The Middle Age, The World System in the 21st Century, published by the International House of Japan in 2002, and Japan in Asia, Post-World War uh, Diplomacy, which is published by Japan Publishing Industry Foundation for Culture in 2017. He received the medal with purple ribbon in 2012 for his academic achievements. It is our great pleasure to have you, uh, Professor Tanaka. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Professor Jashim, uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Vice Chancellor Professor Atikul Islam, um, uh, friends, uh, good afternoon uh, from Japan. It is my great pleasure and honor uh, to take this opportunity to share my observations and analysis uh, in a uh, webinar hosted by the prestigious North South University. Um, I would like to uh, thank Professor Jashim, uh, Professor uh, Tofik, uh, uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Atikul Islam, um, uh, Ambassador Ito, and all others who make uh, this uh, 
webinar uh, possible and giving me uh, this opportunity. Although the title uh, is Connectivity in the Bay of Bengal Areas, Challenges and Options for Bangladesh, uh, but as uh, Professor Jashim's introduction uh, of myself indicates, I'm uh, 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 not an expert on uh, Bangladesh. And uh, so there may be uh, uh, misunderstanding, uh, the uh, uh, insufficient attention to important uh, issues, and um, uh, the uh, misjudgment about uh, the, uh, the, the country's uh, conditions. Um, I'm, uh, however, uh, uh, assured that if I make uh, uh, many mistakes, I would be corrected by uh, later by the uh, comments by uh, Vice Chancellor or the Ambassador. The, um, let me uh, uh, start uh, with the, uh, uh, by sharing uh, some slides that I prepared. As I said, um, the, um, the topic is uh, quite specific, uh, but as a, as, a, as a sort of generalist, of a generalist uh, in uh, measuring international uh, relations, uh, before I talk about uh, the connectivity in the Bay of Bengal areas, I would like to look at a, a broader uh, change, long-term change of the world system. And to talk about such uh, change, I uh, would like to uh, uh, share with you an old map uh, preserved uh, in Japan. Uh, this uh, map, uh, currently owned by the Ryukoku University Library in Kyoto, um, is said to be drawn uh, in Korea in 1402. Oh, uh, as it was uh, drawn in uh, uh, Korea, uh, the, uh, the, the Korea uh, appears quite uh, big uh, and uh, quite accurate. And uh, uh, this uh, is Japan, uh, it's uh, lopsided uh, toward the uh, uh, southeast. The, uh, uh, Hokkaido wasn't drawn in it, but uh, the um, uh, Japan's north was drawn, um, uh, uh, directing toward the southeast. Eh? The um, China uh, proper appears uh, fairly accurate uh, with Shantong province and others. And then, um, well, Southeast Asia is somewhere around here, um, uh, lots of islands. And um, the uh, um, India and uh, Sri Lanka uh, uh, is uh, fairly clear, although uh, Bangladesh appears rather uh, hazy in this uh, map. And this map is quite remarkable uh, in the sense uh, the Arabian Peninsula was drawn and even Africa uh, was drawn uh, with the uh, huge waters here well, this uh, is supposed to be uh, the Lake Victoria. The, uh, by the standard of the early 15th century, uh, you, you have to remember this uh, uh, drawn in 1402. Um, this uh, map uh, was probably uh, the most accurate map of uh, the area from Northeast Asia to uh, Southeast Asia to uh, Africa. Um, at that time, well, this was uh, uh, nearly a century before uh, Europeans came uh, into these uh, seas. Um, the Europeans didn't, uh, at that time, have a comparable understanding of the region. And the reason uh, of the existence of this map was because information was exchanged uh, throughout this area, mainly in terms of trade. The famous uh, 
Chinese Almada, uh, headed by uh, Admiral Zheng He, uh, traveled from China uh, to uh, Indian Ocean uh, to uh, uh, sometimes said to the tip of uh, Africa, um, uh, just a few years after, uh, well, just a, about a decade after uh, this map was uh, drawn. Um, in other words, the area uh, we are now beginning to call the Indo-Pacific was already connected, although looser than today's, but connected uh, in the 15th century. Of course, the dramatic change took place in the world in the following uh, centuries. The phenomenon called the rise of the West. This change became uh, more prominent uh, in the 19th century. And this is a, a, a graph uh, I draw uh, based on uh, the GDP estimates made by Professor Angus Madison and the research team uh, succeeding uh, Professor Madison um, the, in the University of Groningen. The, um, and I calculated uh, the share of GDP of various countries and regions. And in 1820, the share of the global GDP uh, of Asia was uh, quite dominant. Uh, but the 19th century saw the rapid rise of the West, uh, blue part uh, went up. So by the middle of the 20th century, um, this trend of the rising West appeared to be permanent. Actually, the trend was not permanent. The late 20th century saw the expansion of economies in East Asia and the rest of Asia as we enter the 21st century. So the wave of blue went up and down and the wave of red uh, uh, appears to go up again. Looking at uh, different countries more uh, minutely, um, this is the change of the per capita GDP based on Madison's uh, estimates uh, in East Asia. As you see, uh, Japan's per capita GDP uh, went uh, beyond 10,000 and 15,000 in the 1960s, but Japan was not alone uh, to follow this pattern. Um, if you look at this, then the Japan was followed by uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, Malaysia, Thailand. And um, now, uh, in, uh, as we enter the 21st century, China, Indonesia, Philippines, and the, the other Southeast Asian countries all um, made the trajectory of uh, going up in terms of per capita uh, GDP, although the absolute level still, uh, some of them below uh, 10,000. Um, um, not just Southeast Asia, uh, South uh, Asia also uh, followed this uh, trend. Um, well, uh, this uh, 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 graph uh, is drawn from the data uh, estimates by Madison Project, and uh, uh, the uh, Bangladesh uh, number appeared in this uh, Madison's uh, uh, figure appeared rather uh, undervalued. Um, if you uh, the um, uh, use uh, uh, IMF data uh, recently published by the uh, uh, economic uh, World Economic Outlook uh, released that last uh, April. The 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 uh, um, current figure, uh, the, uh, the per capita GDP of Bangladesh in uh, 2020 was a thousand ninety dollars and is expected to exceed. In 2021, and reach 3,000 in uh, 2025. Not uh, just South Asia alone, uh, some African countries also registered high growth. The slide shows 
um, that some of the East African uh, countries are following the trajectory of Asia, especially in the 21st century. In other words, we are now observing the rise of the Indo-Pacific for the second time in world history. Since the rise of the West in the 19th century, the center of gravity of the world economy shifted first to the North Atlantic and then shifted to the Asia Pacific in the late uh, 20th century and now shifting to somewhere in the broad Indo-Pacific in the 21st century. Japan, as a trading nation, has always followed uh, this shifting uh, center of economic uh, gravity. In the 1970s and 80s, the concepts of Pacific Basin and the Asia Pacific were on the rise, as shown by uh, former Prime Minister uh, Masayoshi Ohira. Japan took initiative uh, to launch uh, what is called the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Meeting, APEC, in 1989. As we uh, enter the 21st century, Japan began to pay more attention to South Asia. Prime Minister Abe uh, made a speech in the Indian Parliament in 2007, uh, emphasizing that today is the time of the confluence of the two seas. Uh, that is the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And in uh, 2016, uh, Prime Minister Abe officially revealed Japan's vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific in Nairobi on the occasion of uh, the International Conference for African Development uh, called TICAD. Well, in this connection, I would like to uh, point out the significance of the Prime Minister Hashina's visit to Japan and Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe's visit to Bangladesh in 2014. Through these mutual visits, the two countries agreed to launch the Bay of Bengal Industrial Growth Belt Initiative, Big B. Actually, in between these uh, uh, two uh, prime ministers' visits, I had the opportunity to visit Bangladesh as JICA's then uh, president. And um, I was uh, given opportunity to deliver a speech at the uh, University of Dhaka. And uh, in that uh, speech, I uh, made a similar analysis uh, that I just made and said, uh, now in the uh, first quarter of the 21st uh, century, um, the world economy is shifting uh, its center from the Pacific to a much broader area, which I call the Indo-Pacific region. I used the word, uh, the Indo-Pacific, um, in other words, two years ahead of our prime minister. Uh, although, um, when I, I, I conducted um, an interview with Prime Minister Abe after he retired the, uh, last summer uh, for a um, 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 uh, journal on diplomacy in Japan. And I asked uh, when uh, you uh, uh, conceived of the idea of the uh, Indi Indo-Pacific, uh, he said uh, uh, he uh, began to uh, realize the importance of uh, the uh, uh, what is later to be called the Indo-Pacific, uh, even before he became a prime minister uh, for the first time in 2006. So uh, I think uh, uh, it may be a, a bit uh, uh, presumptuous uh, for me uh, to uh, 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 claim uh, a priority of the using the Indo-Pacific uh, concept in Japan. Um, so I think uh, there was a general uh, tendency uh, to uh, consider the importance of the big area from Northeast Asia uh, to Southeast Asia, South Asia, and the, the uh, uh, Eastern Africa. But uh, the regional concept of the Indo-Pacific, uh, when I talked about it in 2014, uh, was not uh, particularly familiar to many people. But uh, since Japan expressed its vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific, um, 
since that time, increasing number of countries are beginning to use it uh, in their conceptions of their regional policy and uh, strategy. ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, published its own uh, what's called the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific. The United States under President uh, uh, Trump, as well as President Biden, embraces the concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Recently, uh, France, the UK, and Germany are paying close attention to the region and published uh, their own uh, strategic uh, documents. The IMF World Economic Outlook, I mentioned when I talked about the uh, um, uh, per capita GDP of Bangladesh, um, predicts uh, the resurgence of strong growth in the Indo-Pacific uh, region once the pandemic uh, is over. The, um, well, this is the uh, growth rate uh, registered uh, in the IMF's World Economic uh, Outlook. Um, in 2019, um, the red uh, indicates uh, from 6% uh, or more growth, and uh, um, reddish countries are uh, located along uh, this Indo-Pacific uh, area. Um, of course, 2020 was a terrible uh, year. Uh, many countries, including Japan, uh, registered negative growth although Bangladesh uh, had the, uh, uh, the positive one uh, in 2020. The um, uh, IMF's projection for 2025 uh, indicates this graph. Um, mostly uh, a positive growth are uh, taking, uh, 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 supposed to, taking, uh, to take place in the uh, Indo-Pacific um, region uh, with the expectation uh, that Bangladesh and India uh, Vietnam uh, and some sub-Saharan African countries uh, will make uh, more than 6% uh, growth. So this is uh, the broader context in which we talk about the connectivity in the Bay of Bengal. In the speech that I uh, made at the University of Dhaka in 2014, uh, I said, the Bay of Bengal is certainly centrally located within this tectonic change as it can function as a key junction between the two oceans. And that I said, Big B uh, foresees Bangladesh transcending its national borders to become a node and hub of the regional economy. As I said in uh, uh, 2014, the significance of constructing a long uh, awaited deep seaport at Matavari couldn't be emphasized more. With the deep seaport being the critical hub, we would be able to anticipate an emergence of industrial center uh, similar to Japan's uh, Kashima, uh, north of Japan, and Thailand's eastern uh, seaboard. But having a deep seaport is extremely important given the prospect of Bangladesh's future trade and manufacturing uh, industry and understanding. Um, this is the normal slide that is used by uh, JICA, uh, emphasizing uh, the uh, um, key components of uh, uh, Big B. Uh, consisting of energy and power, uh, transport, um, uh, investment, climate, and others. And uh, the, uh, uh, this area could be uh, um, the, uh, really the uh, northern hub uh, to connect the uh, inland uh, Bangladesh, uh, going through Bangladesh, both to uh, India and uh, Nepal and Bhutan, and uh, to the wider uh, area. Uh, through the Bay of Bengal. The, um, I would like to uh, look at uh, the significance of uh, the development of this region uh, from the investigation of uh, the trading pattern of uh, Bangladesh. 
the well, this is the uh, um, uh, export of uh, um, uh, Bangladesh uh, uh, from 1990 to uh, 2020, and uh, I uh, combine all EU con uh, countries into a single uh, line. And uh, from this uh, figure, it is apparent um, that um, the, uh, the European Union and the United States dominates the Bangladesh's uh, uh, um, export destinations. And all others uh, appeared rather uh, difficult to see because uh, absolute level is so different. Um, but uh, uh, if you uh, exclude uh, the EU and uh, uh, US, then you will see a uh, uh, clearer picture about uh, Bangladesh's relations with uh, uh, ASEAN, India, Japan, uh, and Sub-Sahara Africa. And this is the figure. Um, this is the, the graph excluding EU and uh, US. Now you can see uh, the importance of four destinations, India, Japan, ASEAN, and uh, China. And uh, uh, this graph indicates recently uh, China is surpassed by uh, ASEAN as an export uh, destination. The uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, remains very uh, small in comparison with others, but uh, you can see a, a upward a, a trend. The... Now, if you look at imports, uh, three economies uh, stand uh, out, uh, China and India. And um, because there are too many lines, I again would like to exclude uh, EU and US uh, to see the pattern uh, more clearly. Um, well, this uh, again uh, indicates that uh, uh, Three import sources are very important for Bangladesh, um, China, uh, ASEAN, and India. And uh, in terms of absolute uh, value, uh, China is bigger uh, than either uh, India or ASEAN. Uh, but um, the, as you see, uh, um, even though smaller than uh, China, uh, as import sources, uh, India and ASEAN uh, are quite uh, um, important. If you combine ASEAN and India, that would be bigger than uh, China as a source of uh, importation. From these trading pattern of Bangladesh, we can conclude that export markets of EU and US are very, very important for the future of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, but India, Japan, ASEAN, and China are also very uh, important. Um, well, importance of India appears obvious as uh, uh, it is uh, your neighbor. But ASEAN's importance, well, uh, Myanmar is your neighbor, but uh, ASEAN's importance um, should be, I think, recognized uh, more. If you, of course, if you divide ASEAN into 10 countries, uh, each uh, is smaller uh, in comparison with China, uh, India, or Japan. Uh, but combined, uh, ASEAN is a formidable export uh, destination and source of uh, imports. ASEAN's uh, total population uh, is uh, 667 uh, million, um, roughly half the size of China. Um, but as you see, uh, the levels of uh, 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 export destination or sources of import destination, ASEAN is in a way comparable to both China and uh, India. Uh, so for long distance trade with EU and US, an increasing importance of ASEAN, in addition to India, China, and Japan. And to... Uh, make these pattern uh, more effective and smooth, 
I believe the construction of a deep seaport is really critical. Given the recent uh, good economic performance of Bangladesh, the future appears uh, quite bright. But there may be uh, many conditions of future prosperity of Bangladesh and more broadly uh, of the prosperity of the Indo-Pacific. I think the most important one is the preservation of peace. If you look at the rise of East Asia in the late 20th century to 21st century, the remarkable fact is that in East Asia, there have been no interstate wars since the Sino-Vietnamese War of 1979. This is remarkable in comparison with other regions of the world, such as the Middle East. This is also remarkable in comparison with the East Asia of the past. Until the end of the 1970s, the East Asia was the war zone of the world. Immediately after the Second World War, um, we had huge scale Chinese Civil War, Korean War, Indochina War, Vietnam War, uh, and so forth. East Asia uh, developed rapidly uh, as it became a zone of no wars. The Indo-Pacific as a much broader region may have more challenges as there are still unstable and fragile countries uh, in the region. If you look at the current conditions of Myanmar, and current conditions of Afghanistan, you cannot become so or optimistic. And East Asia, part of the Indo-Pacific, has its own uncertainties. The biggest uncertainty facing the Indo-Pacific, I think, is the implications of the growing power and assertiveness of China. The growing Chinese power increases concerns among many countries, uh, but particularly in recent years among liberal democracies. As long as China uh, is weak, the authoritarian nature of the Chinese Communist Party rule does not pose much concerns in liberal democracies. As long as China is weak, um, how repressive uh, the domestic uh, rule in, in China uh, uh, realistically does not pose security threats to uh, uh, prosperous and strong liberal democracies. But the increasing Chinese economic, technological, and military power is creating fear that China might impose authoritarian restrictions inside liberal democracies, even if it does not resort to arms. Chinese tendency to impose economic sanctions uh, against the country with different political opinions uh, does not reassure uh, the leaders of uh, liberal democracies. Uh, well, current examples, of course, include uh, Chinese uh, attitude toward Australia uh, on uh, Australia's insistence of the investigation of the origins of the uh, COVID-19 virus and China imposed a high tariff on Australian wine and Australian beef, et cetera. And previously, uh, China uh, um, virtually stopped uh, the uh, uh, Chinese tourists to South Korea when uh, South Korea uh, um, allowed the United States to uh, uh, build the anti-ballistic missile uh, sites in South Korea. And uh, uh, China stopped uh, buying uh, Salmon from Nobe when a uh, uh, Nobel Peace Prize was uh, given to a Chinese uh, um, um, the, um, uh, progressive uh, um, novelist. The, these are the fear about somehow indirect uh, 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 potential coercion. But the growing military power also pose direct security uh, threats to neighboring countries. Chinese Coast Guard ships almost regularly enter the Japanese territorial waters around the Senkaku Islands in East China Sea. China is increasing its military exercise 
is around the Taiwan Strait. China solidified its control on the artificially made islands in South China Sea and built up military facilities there. Well, at this moment, China does not appear to change courses. The Xi Jinping government increases its authoritarian control domestically and engages in what is called a wolf warrior diplomacy. All foreign criticisms are set aside or criticized as interference into domestic affairs of China. Foreign policy spokesperson and Chinese media almost ridicule what they consider uh, incompetent liberal democracies in handling uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Even the concerns of liberal democracies uh, and threat perception of China's neighbors and China's determination not to give in. International politics in the middle of the 21st century is destined to become conflictual. As recent moves by liberal democrat democracies illustrated by the so-called Quad Summit among US, Japan, Australia, and India, and the G7 summit, we anticipate a much closer security cooperation among the liberal democracies. So uh, structurally, the current competition between China and liberal democracies appears quite similar to the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the West. However, there is a critical difference with the previous Cold War. That is deep economic interdependence. Um, the trading pattern of the world economy changed very much in the 21st century. Um, well, this uh, map uh, indicates uh, which countries are the biggest uh, trading partner uh, for each country. Uh, and this is, indicates the condition in the year 2000. And uh, the blue indicates uh, that this country's uh, biggest trading partner is the United States. So Canada's biggest trade, uh, 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 biggest trading partner uh, was the United States. Uh, so are Mexico and many Latin American countries. And the uh, um, green indicates Germany was uh, the, the, the biggest uh, trading company. And then uh, Southeast Asia, Australia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, and China, uh, the biggest trading partner uh, in 2000 uh, was Japan. And um, there are uh, the only a few uh, countries uh, with which China has the biggest uh, trading uh, volume. Uh, the actually, although the smaller countries was not depicted in 2000, uh, seven countries uh, in uh, the, China was the biggest uh, trading country. Well, the, the, there are uh, in 2000, uh, 52 countries uh, where the United States was the biggest countries, including Japan and Bangladesh. Japan was the top uh, uh, trading partners with fair number of Asian uh, countries, including China and some Southeast Asian countries. That was the condition in 2000. This uh, pattern dramatically changed uh, over the next uh, uh, 15 years. 2015 uh, condition is uh, shown in this uh, uh, map. Uh, there are many, many countries uh, with red. Um, the, uh, uh, in this year, 2015, China became the top trading partner with 50 economies, including Bangladesh, Japan, and the United States. Uh, the U United States was the top trading partner with 37 uh, countries. Well, this is the uh, uh, picture uh, of last year. Uh, not much change, um, but uh, actually under the COVID-19 pandemic, 
more countries uh, traded with China. China became the top trading partner with as many as 62 countries and economies. Number for the US was 35. So this uh, indicates the importance of China and uh, um, dependence on uh, China for trade for many, many uh, countries. But the important fact of geopolitics today is that the US uh, and China are biggest trading partner each other. For US, China is the biggest trading partner. For China, the US uh, is the biggest trading partner. So, or ideological and geopolitical competition continues uh, under a very deep and complex interdependence between the two uh, competitors. What should be done? I think uh, there are no easy uh, answers. But first, I think there should be no misunderstanding of the intentions of uh, the competitors. So far, China has become rather cautious in front of strong power. So I think it is good that liberal democracies appears quite united after the arrival of the Biden administration in the United States. Liberal democracies should create a framework of cooperation among themselves against which China is not able to coerce other countries without resorting to arms. Second, there should be effective means of communication between China and the rest of the world. Establishment and maintenance of emergency communication mechanism is uh, important. Japan and China has started such a mechanism over East uh, China Sea. Uh, although um, the uh, uh, effectiveness uh, is still uh, to be uh, proven. Third, all countries should explore, I think, areas of cooperation uh, along with competition. Responses to the climate change is an obvious one. Unless China and the United States reduce the greenhouse gas emissions significantly, the crisis of the climate cannot be avoided. China can also, I think, contribute to the development of the Indo-Pacific region under their scheme of Belt and Road Initiative. As long as it is conducted in a transparent manner, with full consideration of not increasing the debt burden of partner countries and without discriminating other partners. Chinese efforts also become an integral element of the Indo-Pacific development. I think uh, constructing uh, the Bay of Bengal uh, connectivity uh, would be uh, an arena of uh, a cooperation. Uh, if uh, sufficient care uh, is taken. As I said before, preservation of peace is an essential condition of the Indo-Pacific, including China. Chinese leaders, I think, understand this. Given this, the connectivity of the Bay of Bengal will certainly become the critical element of the Indo-Pacific cooperation and the future prosperity of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, with this, I uh, would like to stop my uh, initial uh, presentation and uh, would like to uh, hear uh, uh, comments, uh, criticisms, correction, uh, and many others. Thank you very much. Dr. Joshim, are you there, the moderator? Yo, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Tanaka, for your very comprehensive uh, lecture. Uh, it's a great learning for us, um, especially we learn a lot about our uh, uh, Bay, I mean, the Bay of Bengal. And uh, especially uh, the, uh, the strategy of Big B, uh, you presented 
we have a lot of interest in that and we believe that this strategy will help uh, Bangladesh to promote its exports and ultimately will contribute to the development of Bangladesh. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe the audience uh, uh, got a lot of interest uh, in your lecture and uh, they have a lot of comments and uh, question. Um, at this stage, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Ambassador Shofir, the Bangladeshi ambassador to Australia uh, among us. And uh, now I would like to request uh, Ambassador Shohidul Haq, uh, the professorial fellow uh, of uh, uh, SIPG North South University and the former Foreign Secretary of Bangladesh, a very successful Foreign Secretary uh, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the history of uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, to uh, uh, shed some lights on the uh, lecture uh, provided by Professor Tanaka. Uh, Ambassador uh, Shwedul Haq, please. Thank you very much, um, um, Dr. Jashim. Uh, uh, indeed, a very uh, enlightening uh, reflections, uh, both uh, past, present, and future by uh, Professor Tanaka on the uh, geopolitics, but more on geoeconomics of, uh, of Bay of Bengal. Uh, I, I will take a couple of minutes to reflect and I'll tell you, I'll tell you why uh, he was referring to the period uh, beginning with 2014 uh, uh, till today with the Big B in Bangladesh, where uh, uh, as heading the foreign office, uh, uh, as foreign secretary, uh, we were deeply uh, engaged and uh, I will try and get some of the reflections. So I, I will I'll start off with a, with a, you know, with a statement which uh, uh, Professor Tanaka has uh, uh, given an indication that Bay of Bengal uh, historically has been very important even before Atlantic became important to Europe and the world politics. But uh, with the uh, departure of the colonies and uh, the nationalist governments which took over around the little states of Bay of Bengal and Indian Ocean were more inward looking. Uh, and then whole importance of uh, the, the sea area uh, slided. Uh, but uh, by 1970, 75, 80, that again uh, started taking off. Initially, with the uh, with the uh, with the geoeconomics, but now it's more geopolitics. So I will look at more geopolitics as Professor Tanaka has focused more on the uh, on on the geoeconomics, although he has touched on the politics as well. Now uh, I, I will I will take a Bangladeshi view how Bangladesh looks at the Bay, and how Bangladesh looks at Japan, and how Bangladesh looks at the whole issue of a uh, connectivity uh, uh, for. Uh, uh, for uh, for this region. Now, uh, Bay of Bengal is a very unique uh, uh, in terms of geography. It is a triangular uh, basin, largest basin. So uh, it, that's where all these uh, disaster issues uh, uh, come in, uh, but also geopolitically very important. You know, you are talking about Indo-Pacific where two, I mean, there are a couple of seas but one is the Arabian Sea, the other one is the um, India, um, uh, Indian Ocean or Bay of Bengal Sea. Uh, and, and if you look at the Arabian Sea, it's Pakistan. And if you look at um, the Bay of Bengal uh, or Indian Ocean Sea, then you see India, Myanmar and, uh, uh, and, and Bangladesh. So that's, that's the geopolitical uh, sort of a frame that uh, I would be taking in. And, and surprisingly, both are in a kind of a, uh, going through a very fluid state, uh, centering around Afghanistan and Central Asia in Arabian Sea, and in our part is Myanmar, uh, with huge potential to blow up uh, in 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 future. So this is uh, uh, this is this is something I wanted to draw uh, uh, your attention to. In terms of a uh, reemergence, uh, is very interesting uh, because. Uh, uh, it took about 260, according to my own reading, uh, for the center of gravity of politics and economy to come back to, uh, to, to our, our region, which is Asia. And that's why I think 
and it's, it has been a turbulent arrival and, and there's a lot of winds around uh, and that, uh, that uh, Professor Tanaka has on and off uh, uh, indicated, uh, sometimes um, directly, sometimes indirectly. Uh, and I'll come back to that whole issue of India, China uh, and the rest of it. Uh, now, the, the Bay of Bengal is, is, is not only geopolitically important, but geoeconomically important. Uh, Mr. Talaka has looked at uh, uh, the GDP and, and the rest of it. Let me also sort of uh, remind all of us that this is a very important passage for all the goods, oil, and now services passes through. Almost around 60% of whatever trading takes place is, is, is through, uh, through this region. Uh, so that's, that we have to keep that in mind. It's not only the little states uh, GDP, but also things passes through the adjacent water. In, in order to get the geopolitical feel of it, I'll, I, I thought I would share with you two important uh, uh, incident. Uh, I, I still call it incident. In 15th of December, 1971, USS Enterprise arrived in the Bay of Bengal to rescue the, uh, the Pakistani forces. That's what they said. Uh, and, uh, and that's an important event because the whole seventh fleet was about to arrive in the Bay of Bengal and change the actually the map and geopolitics which we see today. But interestingly on 16th December, Bangladesh was liberated by the joint forces of India and Bangladesh. And that sort of a, put the whole uh, politics in the Americans uh, was caught by surprise. So they, they actually withdrew and they realized that the Soviets were there before them. Now, a similar naval exercise happened of, of that scale in July, 2020, the, uh, uh, the famous uh, joint exercise of India in America of naval exercise uh, in the Andaman and Nicobar Island. In, as I gather, I'm not confirmed that USS NIMS which is a nuclear powered submarine uh, and a nuclear powered carrier were also uh, in the vicinity. So you know, that also shows where we are in terms of geopolitics. These maneuvers are not only simple naval maneuver or ships going around, but it speaks much larger than that, that we need to keep. And that's where Bangladesh's uh, uh, position and policy uh, should, should uh, uh, emerge. Uh, I know I, I, I'll have to cut short, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so what I'm suggesting, there are old Bay of Bengal within the Indo-Pacific, there are new players. And within the new players, Bangladesh is an important player and an actor. It's not only a player with potential, but it is also an actor. Therefore, I, I draw my hypothesis as to how Bangladesh need to uh, uh, need to look at. Now, Professor Talaka has uh, rightly pointed out that currently there is a kind of a, I would call rivalry. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's past the stages of tension a long time back. Rivalry between China and India, despite the deep interdependence that they have, which they are now trying to minimize uh, from the both end. Uh, the literal states, smaller states, including Bangladesh, uh, faces a strategic challenge and your choice. So, so that wasn't there before in 80s, 90s. You know, the, the rivalry wasn't that uh, acute. So that's what, and in that, India, Japan, and some of the other middle powers, sorry to use the word in the absence of a, bit, a nicer word, uh, uh, is, 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 is about to play. So that's, you know, I, I'm creating the, uh, uh, frame for Bangladesh to come in. Now, with that, keep in mind that we have a growing economic interest, but there's also geopolitical game which is trailing on uh, what that Bangladesh has done, say, uh, during the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's uh, period. Uh, she has, a, a, you know, I think defined connectivity as one of the uh, policies uh, within the broader uh, issue of uh, not only connecting dots, but also um, suggesting that we, we need 
to be non-confrontational in this politics. And we have to have friendship with all, which eventually we can term as a balanced foreign policy of Bangladesh with all the geopolitical powers in the Bay and in the Indo-Pacific. Because Bangladesh is both party to the BRI and to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, now, she has also defined connectivity, uh, Professor Tanaka, in a much bigger way, not only in terms of rail, road, and yearling, but also in terms of ideologies, in terms of knowledge sharing, in terms of technologies, and in terms of culture. I will request her colleagues to look at the statement she made in the SAC summit in Kathmandu in 2014, where she has uh, manifested the, uh, the policy that Uh, that we are, we are doing. I'm, I'm coming to close in terms of uh, looking at Bangladesh. So Bangladesh, as I, as I read from outside now, continue to follow that, you know, sort of a balanced approach. Friendship to all and balanced to us, none but your father of the nation, Bongo Mundi, suggested yeah, in our premises of uh, foreign policy. Yes. No, 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 no. Take us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so that's one. The second one is, and, and, and Mel Khurshed is here, he will, uh, will certainly um, give his views. I think Bay of Bengal is a third neighbor of Bangladesh. We are used to seeing only land masses as a neighbor, India and Myanmar. But we have been in the foreign office promoting that Bay of Bengal is our third neighbor, through which we are linked with uh, uh, Sri Lanka, with uh, uh, Thailand, uh, with Malaysia. So. You know, that the, the whole concept of land-based neighborhood has to has to go through changes and it has gone through some bit of a changes in the in our foreign policy our, our outlook, which, which needs to be brought out when we talk about uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Bay of Bengal. Uh, you know, strangely, Bangladesh looks at Bay in a very flat manner. You know, it's, it's the very romantic way as uh, Ravindranath Thakur said, you know, you look at the sea and continue to write poems, but you know, he, he himself said, we have to cross it. So, so that, that speaks about the Bengali mentality. And there's another reason which, uh, which Professor William Shandl has brought out in terms of looking at Bay of Bengal from the Bangladesh side. He said, comes from the Himalayan, flattens it out, and it looks to Bengalis, uh, you know, it's a featureless sea. It's not a featureless sea. Certainly no longer today. And it was not in 18th century. So that is a very uh, perceptional change that we need to need to do before we uh, before we we go into that. Uh, I think I'll take uh, two more minutes. One minute on and Japan. Japan, Bangladesh looks at Japan not only as a development partner, as a very close ally, both in terms of temperament, in terms of our flag, which Bangabundu saw similarities, and uh, and also in terms of trade and businesses, and it's a very dependable, reliable friendship. And I am I'm, I'm saying it because we had, when initially in 2014, 15, 2013, 14, uh, the whole Bay of Bengal project came in, we also read the geopolitics behind the Bay of Bengal. And there was good, productive dialogue between the Bangladesh side and the Japanese side. Um, and there was an intense discussion about the big B. Uh, and finally we reached to a consensus which then finally uh, the two prime ministers adopted and which, which likely to change the geopolitics of not only of Bay, but also of Bangladesh because, because of that. And, and I think we, have, we need a very sensitive handling of that. Otherwise it might create tensions with our other big neighbors for China. So, so that's, uh, that's how we, we look at China and we, we subscribe to the whole idea of free and open Indo-Pacific. And we, we have our uh, uh, policy narrated uh, on that, shared both with the Chinese and with Indians and with Japanese uh, in writing that this is what we look at. It's a four point policy talk. Uh, and, and I think fairly with a little bit of a, uh, unease, all uh, in particular China has, uh, has accepted. Now, uh, way forward, you know, it's true that Asia is rising and at the not be warmly welcomed by non-Asians. Let me, let me just face it. Let me tell you this. You know, it's not easy to rise in the midst of all. It's not 
18th, 16th, or 19th century rise, when it was easy to defeat China and India, uh, it, it will not be the same. So, so that's one that we need to keep it in. And in that Bangladesh, whatever small it may sound itself, uh, is a player which needs to play his card very close to his chest and very wisely. So that, uh, uh, that's where I will. Now, the, the last one, the, post, the, the way we read it from, from Bangladesh side, the post-America world and Asia would not be, uh, not, not belong to a one particular big power. It will perhaps be a cohort of, uh, uh, of, of powers trying to govern uh, Indo-Pacific and Bangladesh. That's where the whole issue of balancing a foreign policy comes in uh, very, very important. But the danger is currently there's a vacuum and vacuum has been exaggerated by the unsettling events in, um, in, uh, in, um, in Central Asia and Afghanistan. I'm stretching it to Central Asia and see how it's going to have an impact on South Asia because Afghanistan sits both on West Asia, Central Asia and South Asia in between. So it has an influence both ideologically, historically and economically on the three sub-regions which, uh, which features uh, very prominently in the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. So the vacuum uh, is important, uh, but it also be seen how uh, Bangladesh continue to use its strategic and economic uh, advantages to its own interest. Thank you very much. It has been a wonderful uh, um, to hear uh, of Professor Tanaka on this. And sorry for taking a little longer, I was carried away. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ambassador Shridul Hawk, uh, for a rigorous analysis on uh, the subject matter. Uh, so uh, now I would like to uh, request Admiral Khurshid, Khurshid Ul Alum. Uh, you already know uh, he is the best marine expert in our country. And we acknowledge his contribution to settle the maritime disputes we had uh, with Myanmar and uh, India. Uh, sir, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, if you kindly uh, share some lights on the lecture. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zashim. And also thanks to Professor Tanaka for giving us a wider perspective of the <coughs> whole world uh, in compared to the Bay of Bengal. Uh, uh, and also thanks to our um, uh, ex-foreign secretary who has already enlightened us on the various aspect. I will not be uh, repeating or try to avoid those. I will try to limit my part on the connectivity, the options and challenges for Bangladesh. That will be probably better for me. In fact, uh, we have a very myopic view of the Indian Ocean, uh, of the Bay of Bengal. We think that it is up, up to Cox's Bazar and there it, it finishes. But uh, it, it goes below Sri Lanka. And this is the busiest, you know, international waterways in the whole world. Around 40,000 ships almost passes through this water. It was uh, half of world energy, trade and everything goes through there. And that's why even in 14,000 maps, it was, uh, this area was the heart of the global history. Now it has become the heart of international uh, politics uh, in a way, but uh, as we call it a third neighbor, why we call it a third neighbor? Because if we want to go to Myanmar, you need a passport, you want to go to India, you need a passport and visa. But if you want to go to Bengal and beyond, Atlantic, Pacific, and also the uh, Indian Ocean, you don't need a passport and visa. What you need is sheep and skilled manpower. And there we lack, you know, that is what is our uh, uh, problem. And of course, uh, overall, uh, if you can see the connectivity is at sea, is port late connectivity. You need ports. And Professor Tanaka has very rightly said that Matarbari is going to be one of the deep sea ports. We have other two ports, but they are not actually, you cannot call them deep sea port, smaller uh, area. But why uh, we need the ports? First of all, for the maritime connectivity, 
because like we have a trade of $90 billion. Uh, say two year, one and a half year back, we had $90 billion. Last year was not that, uh, that good one. So in $90 billion, this trade is carried by about four and a half thousand ships coming from other countries. And we pay almost $9 billion as a freight to these ships because Bangladesh has hardly 60 ships to carry our own goods. Although UNCTAD rules allows us to carry 50% or at least 40% of our own goods by our own ships, but that doesn't happen because we do not have the capability to carry those uh, ships. So we have to pay to the foreign uh, shippers to come. And also, if we have a deep sea port, much bigger ship will be able to come and then we may be able to pay less. Exploitation of marine resources, as you rightly pointed out, we have got almost 118,000 square kilometer of sea. Whereas uh, in Bangladesh, uh, if you totally add up all the rivers, our bower and everything, it is around 15,000 square kilometer. But then we are called Nodimatrik Bangladesh. But we could have been a Shumudramatrik Bangladesh. In that case, our eyes would have been uh, focused on the, on the Western side. When I take um, the vice chancellor is here, I draw his attention that university like North South doesn't teach anything or there is no research faculty uh, which relates to the uh, Bay of Bengal, which will help Bangladesh in the, in the, in the, in the coming years, you know. Um, other than the trade and commerce, of course, um, we have a lot of um, infrastructure we have already created in the country. Like there is a maritime university now, there are oceanographic department. There is also Bangladesh Oceanographic Research Center in Cox's Bazar. And uh, we have changed the maritime zone law of 1974. And there is also a blue economy cell. And there is uh, also blue economy action plan we have uh, had already there, you know. But there are challenges in the Bay of Bengal, you know. First of the challenges that what we faced is the smuggling, that is the drug smuggling. Drugs are coming in good numbers <coughs> through Bangladesh. Then we have piracy in the um, Strait of Malacca. It has not yet gone. Then pollution, either by ship or from land or from atmosphere. These are increasing in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, studies have shown the plastics are found even in the seas, even in the fish. And also you have uh, this uh, problem of trash fish, you know. A lot of smaller fish, we throw them out at sea. That is also going around. And most importantly, is the maritime domain awareness we really do not have. Neither we have any capability to find out what type of ships are in the, in the, in the area. And say people from uh, Dinaspur, they would hardly would like to jump into the sea. And uh, maybe better than, uh, you know, much better, much lesser than the Borishal people who wouldn't fear the sea as well. So there are organizations here in the, within the Bay of Bengal, <coughs> like you can say BIMSTEC, Indian Ocean Rim Association, SARC, and the uh, ASEAN. All these countries, of course, they can closely develop the capacity we are lacking right at the moment, because we must understand the sea is not a zero sum game. The Indian Ocean cannot belong to India. <coughs> Even though they might say it is the Indian Ocean, but it is not a zero-sum game because the India cannot preclude other ships to come into the Indian Ocean, just like any other uh, sea areas. So that's one of the important factors. So what we can say is this, if we look back, the maritime connectivity in this part of the world started long before because we did not depend on the steam. We depended on the monsoon. Because of the monsoon weather, if you can see in the sixth and seventh century also, there were trade with the Arabs in the Indian Ocean, in the India and also other countries. And because of the monsoon, we took the advantage of the monsoon. Whereas the Europe had to wait for this steamship to become and then they come, you know, they, then they started coming in this part of here. So from that sort of backwater, Bay of Bengal has now in a very strategic space, uh, looking for uh, you know, a bigger role to play. But of course, what we understand from Professor Tanaka's role 
we are very much with it that rule based you know uh, uh, order out at sea whether it is under indo pacific or it is under unclos uh, whatever you may call it the rule based maritime order is a must until and unless we maintain peace and the rule based order out at sea is is going to be very difficult for any one of us to probably grow in the same rate as they are growing today the the economic figures whatever have been shown by professor tanaka i don't know whether uh, they were shown as a sort of um, uh, you know hint to bangladesh look this is what would be your condition uh, you know if you don't do this or don't do that so let me also only say this that we have come through all these years 50 years of our age we are matured enough we know how to carry out the trade whether it is in the west or it is in the west east and that's probably will continue but we are on this particular aspect we do appreciate whether it is a bri or uh, it is indo pacific strategy whatever strategy you call it so long it brings peace out in the sea lanes of our communication our trade remains open and we can probably do things as you like it uh, that should be the our focus and uh, our logistical arrangement should must increase so that the port led development whatever we have now and also more connectivity among the countries in the bay of bengal we have only one connectivity with india right now uh, is a coastal shipping but we need to connect all other countries in the region because in that case our shipping cost will reduce and we would be able to send our goods uh, in in a way uh, very very easily to other countries so whatever you know the development we have been able to do we have not achieved much on the blue economy as far as exploration of marine resources are concerned japan is our good friend we have also approached them if they can help us to exploit some of the resources even deep sea fishing is still stuck because we don't have uh, the trawlers which can go below 20 30 or 40 meters of water so that is one point and also we have found out gas hydrate in the in the deep sea uh, more than 100 trillion this is this experiment we have done in the in the foreign ministry right now uh, we have got the result and also uh, let me tell you we have also got um, some species of biotechnology which will actually provide all types of cosmetics so this is also in the study set by two months time we will complete the first phase of the study then we will try to look for commercialization so the bay of bengal is going to provide i can tell you that yes uh, the the garments industry is of course the only industry we have but as an alternative to the garments industry we can also provide from the sea from uh, more or less half of the amount uh, within few years if we can have a probably uh, the a package which will help us to go to the deeper part of the ocean and exploit the marine resources uh and and whether it is uh you know um uh, uh, joint venture or uh in fact with the help of bangladeshi companies i think i will uh, stop here because i have another uh, thing uh, another you know webinar is going on thank you very much for inviting me but my submission will remain to the vice chancellor that uh, the north south university should open some department which will carry out some sort of uh you know also research on the oceanic material which will help bangladesh to become a developed country in 2041 in three years of study we have got two and if we can continue this many other issues will come up and then bangladesh can be proud of the ocean area we got thank you very much uh to you thank you dr joshin and also professor and to all other dignitaries for listening me thank you thank you sir thank you very much uh, for giving us uh, some of your valuable time and we are again enlightened and you rightly pointed out and identified some of the potential areas uh, where our trusted friend japan with their technological advancement with their skill and knowledge uh, can help us and as i mentioned uh, at the very beginning that uh, to become a developed country that is our goal Uh, our prime minister our leaders uh, time to time remind the nation 
that uh, we want to be a developed country by uh, 2041. And actually, we must explore uh, the resources we have uh, in the Bay of Bengal. And of course, we lack, uh, you know, technological expertise and knowledge. And uh, Japan can definitely help us uh, in this regard. So uh, we have already got uh, some uh, interesting uh, comments and question and uh, uh, in the in the chat box. Um, I would like to raise one question and, and then I will uh, invite uh, Professor Mustafiz from uh, CPD uh, to share his views. But before that, uh, Professor Emdad of uh, uh, North South University raised a question to Professor Tanaka. Uh, the emergence of powerful China in the 21st century is a reality. How best the regional countries can adjust uh, with this ground reality? Uh, Professor Tanaka, uh, if you kindly address this question. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, this is the, uh, uh, um, at least one of the most important questions uh, uh, for uh, the regional countries uh, in uh, toward the middle of uh, 21st uh, century. Um, the, um, well, it uh, partly depends on uh, uh, how China uh, will uh, conduct its own uh, diplomacy and uh, activities. And uh, um, there uh, is, uh, I don't believe, uh, there is any um, uh, set formula that guarantee uh, um, success. The, um, um, the, uh, because um, the, um, we don't know uh, the um, um, rising China uh, uh, will take what uh, course in uh, the future. And uh, um, I think uh, each country uh, should try uh, its best uh, to uh, have good relations uh, with uh, uh, this rising power uh, without uh, being uh, subordinated uh, by it. And how to do that, uh, I think would require uh, a wise diplomacy, um, as well as, uh, as strengthening uh, its uh, own uh, capability. Um, the, um, um, Also, uh, uh, geographical proximity uh, with uh, China uh, may uh, um, give you uh, different uh, responses. The, uh, also, uh, the uh, uh, sense of uh, uh, values, uh, also uh, depending on what kind of values you uh, attach importance to, uh, would uh, um, make your responses uh, different. Um, because each country is a sovereign state and, and uh, each uh, uh, is, is uh, entitled to have its own uh, uh, view. Um, the, uh, um, as I said, um, the essentially um, the, um, as uh, um, the, uh, uh, Admiral mentioned that uh, uh, we have to do all our best to preserve the rule-based order. And from uh, Japan's perspective, uh, the um, um, waterways, uh, which we call the Indo-Pacific, uh, should be uh, free and open. And um, uh, to the extent that uh, all countries, including China, um, uh, behaves uh, uh, within uh, that order, I think uh, that, that uh, uh, would make th things easier. Um, of course, uh, you know, the reality of international politics, uh, not all countries agree with each other on all issues. And so there are uh, differences of uh, opinions and different interpretations of uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, different uh, uh, behavior. Um, well, China uh, called uh, the uh, judgment of international tribunal of the uh, uh, South China uh, Sea um, a piece of paper, um, the, uh, which uh, not many countries uh, would uh, uh, like. Um, so how to uh, manage these uh, different uh, views? I think, uh, um, I think each country uh, has to do uh, it, its own best uh, to preserve its uh, independence and to preserve uh, its uh, uh, freedom of uh, uh, its behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tanaka, uh, for addressing this question. Um, and now I would like to request Professor Mustafa Zaroman uh, from Center for Peace, uh, uh, Policy and Dialogue, who you all know is a reputed economist in our country. Uh, Professor Mustafa, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. In fact, I joined this very important event uh, in order to listen and learn. Uh, and I think my time has been very well spent, uh, Professor Tanaka. Thank you so much. It was a really a rewarding uh, experience to, uh, to, to hear you. And I agree with uh, uh, the main thesis uh, of your uh, presentation and the arguments that you have given. And also, I would like to uh, mention that uh, Ambassador Shahidul Haq, our former Foreign Secretary and Admiral Khurshid has have also added value to, to and, and strengthened your, your arguments. And my, I have just uh, perhaps three points. One is that I think that Bay of Bengal is just not uh, the third neighbor. I think it should be considered as part of uh, uh, Bangladesh. Uh, uh, I think as, 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 as Ambassador uh, Choudhilok himself uh, has also mentioned and Admiral Khurshid, that there are so much uh, economic uh, potentials and opportunities. If we can really um, uh, uh, make use of the resources in, in, in the Bay of Bengal. So uh, my submission will be that we should not consider Bangladesh territory to be just 144,000 square kilometers. Square. Uh, it, it, it should be uh, adding uh, the, the Bay of Bengal area that we have 118 square uh, thousand square kilometer. And we should say that Bangladesh territory is 262,000 square kilometers. I think that uh, should be the way that we should uh, look at the Bay of Bengal as an integral part and, 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 uh, and as a part of the future opportunities for Bangladesh. So this will be one just um, observation. My second uh, uh, perhaps comment uh, uh, on Professor Tanaka's uh, presentation is, is that Yes, China uh, is the largest trading partner for 62 countries, and 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 its importance is is, is increasing um, uh, over the years. Um, uh, but at the same time, if you look at the composition, uh, China has a trade surplus with almost all of these 62 countries. If you look at Bangladesh, our export to China is less than one billion dollar, and our import is sixteen uh, uh, to eighteen billion dollar, depending on, on on which year we are counting. So, so there is huge trade deficit, and and that's common for most of China's partners. Now, China imports two thousand two hundred billion dollar of imports uh, every year, and and our export is only one billion dollar. So, I think that how we can enhance our export to China, what are the modalities of that? I, I think that uh, should be in the, in the strategy of Bangladesh in going forward, particularly in view of uh, the, the graduation that we, are, uh, we will be having in 2026, when we will not have uh, uh, duty-free, quota-free market access in most of the countries, uh, the, the trading partners that you have mentioned, and in European Union also beyond 2029, we will have to pay uh, our duty. So my question for you is that now, once we graduate, keeping that uh, in, in the perspective and, and for uh, sustainable uh, graduation, uh, we know that we will have to have closer uh, economic partnership with our, uh, with our neighbors, Japan, um, other countries. Um, uh, now, RCEP, which has been signed very recently, 
So that will also uh, be a major challenge for Bangladesh. Our major competitor, Vietnam, will be having zero tariff access, for example, in the market of Japan also, whilst we will have to be entering uh, paying duty beyond 2023. So, so do you think that Bangladesh should start at least as a, as a strategy uh, uh, to be a part of RCEP uh, uh, and, and negotiating uh, trading arrangement with RCEP. Uh, of course, it will be non-reciprocal. It will be give and take. So there is many. There are many challenges in terms of uh, you know the offers and requests that we will have to make. So uh, so do you think that this is something that we should uh, think about? We should um, start our homework in order to negotiate, uh, keeping the medium term future and keeping the post LDC graduation journey. Uh, which awaits us beyond 2026. Thank you. Can I uh, make response? Yeah, please, uh, Professor Tana, please. your kind of response to his query. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Mustafa, uh, for uh, uh, great uh, questions. In my understanding, uh, Bangladesh, uh, is a rising trading uh, power and rising manufacturing uh, country. And um, the uh, after graduation uh, of uh, the uh, uh, LDC uh, the status, I think I, uh, it would be wise uh, to devise a strategy of uh, a trading and manufacturing uh, country. Um, the, uh, that means uh, the, uh, uh, try to maximize the capability uh, and explore uh, export markets uh, which are open uh, to uh, your uh, products. And um, the, uh, I think um, the well, uh, I showed uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, the top traders uh, list in, uh, in the map, uh, but uh, I also have a, a map of uh, a top export destinations and uh, uh, top import uh, source. And I didn't show them, but uh, uh, as uh, Professor Mustafa mentioned, uh, China, uh, the, the reason China is the uh, top trader with uh, uh, as many as 62 uh, countries is because uh, China is actually the largest source of importation for uh, more than 62 countries. And uh, uh, China as an export destination uh, is not so dominant. Uh, the, uh, um, I, in my calculation, uh, China is the, um, um, the, um, uh, the largest uh, uh, top export destination uh, with uh, 39 countries, not 60, uh, more than 60. And, uh, and even there, uh, as uh, Professor Mustafa mentioned, uh, many countries uh, have a trade uh, uh, deficit uh, with uh, China. And, uh, so I think uh, uh, in the case of Bangladesh, uh, the largest export destination uh, is EU and uh, the US and, and uh, many countries in Southeast Asia and India. And so I think uh, the, 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 the strategy the country should uh, devise is uh, to uh, create uh, the uh, open and better conditions in potentially promising export markets. And one way, I think, is to join such international framework as RCEP. Um, the uh, Vietnam, uh, being a member of ASEAN, uh, is a member of RCEP, but Vietnam decided to join a uh, more uh, sort of a, uh, uh, high quality trading scheme called TPP. And uh, I think uh, as a manufacturing and trading country, uh, uh, well, in order to join them, you need to do a lot of homework, but uh, I think uh, uh, it is about time 
to start uh, this. On this occasion, again, the uh, I would like to uh, thank Admiral Kashud uh, for the importance of having a deep sea port. It's a hardware, but uh, but then very very important hardware. Uh, without deep sea port, you cannot uh, um, uh, uh, transport huge quantity uh, of uh, trading goods uh, at a reasonable uh, price. And so, um, I well, anticipating the completion of the Matabari deep uh, sea port in 2025, uh, then I think uh, along with that, it would be, I think, uh, quite wise for, the, uh, uh, for Bangladesh to devise a future uh, uh, a trade uh, strategy, uh, particularly with respect to uh, joining certain uh, uh, economic partnership uh, agreements. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tanaka, uh, for uh, your very comprehensive uh, response. I would like to request uh, uh, Dr. Mohammad Shaidul Alam uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, just give his comments or question uh, just in uh, two or three minutes. Uh, we actually, we have limited time. Yeah, please. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Shadul Alam from Nasrat University. Thank you. Thank you, John, Dr. Joshim, uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Tanaka, uh, for your presentation. And, and I actually enjoyed it very much. I should, I would probably uh, make a comment, give some, a little bit of perspective with Big B and have a question for you. Uh, uh, hopefully I'll be able to do it in three minutes. When I first came across this idea of Big B, I was very ex excited intellectually. This is the big idea that this area, the whole Bay of Bengal area is waiting for. That's what I thought since 1957 when this area actually started its economic degeneration, particularly from colonialization. So going forward, connecting the Bay of, Bay of Bengal area, we foresee a economic resurgence, right? Now, how it will happen? Bangladesh has a big role in that. If, if, if it has to happen as uh, Japan uh, proposes uh, to reconnect this area, the, the literal countries of Bay of Bengal. And already uh, with the strong leadership of uh, our prime minister, Sheikh Hasina, Bangladesh has been making progress on that figure to connect these uh, different countries uh, to make it a more integrated economic region. But a lot more has to be done, right? Now, how, what are the options? What are the choices that we have? What one could say, well, Bangladesh can open up its market and do much more to connect economically. Bangladesh could open its border through land, water, and seas to facilitate this integration. Or would it be something similar to Schengen area in Europe, where it is much more easy to move the, for the labor force? Some, some visa free region or something like that? Or could Bangladesh uh, sign a lot of FTAs, including, Japan, including India, Nepal, Bhutan, and Asia, and also China? Or could Bangladesh actually join ASEAN to make it easy for this, I mean, uh, to, to, to manage all these uh, diplomatic things? If Bangladesh joins ASEAN, then it makes it, it is very easy actually to integrate, right? ASEAN has free trade for all the areas. Now, these are all very difficult questions. Now, who, who thinks about it? I, I understand I, I, Japan is doing its part, but I think uh, on the land of Bangladesh, we need something, to, uh, sort of the think tank, uh, which will actually think through this process and actually advise or guide all the stakeholders on the land, not only Bangladesh, but also the regional stakeholders. And I was actually presenting an idea in Dhaka University conference that why not choose Mujib Nagar to, to locate a commission there on Big B 
and actually uh, that's a huge gesture uh, you know what what better could, place could be right to look at to to integrate this whole bengal area and ex economically and ma make progress and and i think i would uh, i would leave it uh, leave leave the idea at that point uh, uh, to get a response from you on on the particularly on the big big commission or something similar to that thank you okay okay thank you very much uh, uh... Uh, Professor Tanaka, if you kindly respond uh, briefly on uh, uh, his uh, comments and question. And then I have uh, two more questions from the audience, and then we'll wrap up uh, the question and answer session. Well, I think uh, if I might respond to the uh, question about the uh, further options for the development of Bangladesh. Um, the, uh, in addition to uh, the consideration of um, uh, joining such trading scheme uh, like RCEP, um, the, um, um, I think uh, another pillar, of course, as a manufacturing uh, country, uh, uh, I think it would be important to uh, make environment very friendly uh, to attract uh, investment. And... Um, I think one challenge uh, for Bangladesh at this moment uh, is to upgrade uh, the um, um, uh, manufacturing ring. The, um, um, the um, apparel textiles are quite uh, good, competitive, um, but I think uh, uh, one would consider the current period as a uh, uh, put uh, a great opportunity to, uh, for Bangladesh to uh, invite uh, investment in uh, somewhat uh, higher value added uh, manufacturing. Um, you know, uh, the um, I think one factor aside from the uh, uh, geopolitical competition between. Uh, the uh, China and the United States. Uh, well, out of that, uh, there are uh, tendencies uh, to uh, shift uh, the production capability out of China uh, uh, from the geopolitical considerations. Then um, the uh, investment uh, that may be leaving uh, from China uh, should go somewhere. And uh, I believe Bangladesh uh, is uh, uh, in a, a, a quite uh, a strategically advantageous position to uh, attract uh, some of the manufacturing that are leaving China. And um, well, here you need to compete with such countries like Vietnam. Um, the, the, but I think uh, uh, the, it, it is another uh, component uh, that uh, 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 the uh, e economic and the trade uh, strategists uh, in Bangladesh had, have to uh, consider. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Uh, as I say, just uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, how Bangladesh can make a balance in joining the Indo-Pacific strategies and BRI? And uh, on uh, overlapping question, who will ensure peace uh, in the Bay of Bengal, both China uh, and uh, its allies and the USA and its allies are trying to pull regional countries on their sides and other regional countries, non-allied are so weak to take the lead as peace broker. Uh, these are the, uh, I mean, couple of questions uh, raised in the uh, chat box. So if you kindly, uh, uh, address briefly. Yeah, thank you. Well, oh, thank you very much. Um, I think um, you know, uh, the, the, the Bangladesh uh, should uh, uh, try its best to take advantage of both, uh, you know, Indo-Pacific free and open Indo-Pacific uh, uh, vision of Japan and other countries, as well as uh, China's uh, Belt and Road initiatives. Um, I believe now. Um, uh, you are uh, completing the, uh, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, construction of the Padma uh, Bridge. 
um, uh, I think uh, China has been uh, helping. And uh, I rather regret that um, uh, JICA and World Bank uh, uh, um, and stopped uh, financing uh, Padma Bridge construction. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the construction of Padma Bridge is, is a real necessity for Bangladesh. And so to the extent China's uh, uh, help is uh, uh, useful, I think you should uh, 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 um, welcome it. And um, the only thing uh, that uh, you, uh, I think uh, uh, recipient country uh, or, or were being uh, financed uh, had to uh, be careful uh, is that uh, you would not be uh, drawn into a debt trap. And uh, so uh, 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 try to uh, make the debt uh, sustainability uh, sound. I think uh, you can uh, utilize uh, offers from uh, anybody, including China or uh, uh, Japan or the United States. Um, about peace preservation, I don't believe there is any single power that can uh, preserve uh, peace. I think um, uh, peace is preserved uh, by, uh, well, in a rather classical uh, realist view, uh, preserved by the balance. And uh, uh, peace is preserved uh, if no single power uh, believes uh, that uh, it cannot take advantage uh, of uh, the situation to advance its interest by military means. And so if uh, all parties believe that it's uh, uh, too costly uh, to resort to arms, uh, then I think uh, uh, the peace uh, can be preserved. And also, I think if uh, all parties believed that uh, preserving the current uh, state of economic interdependence uh, uh, is in their own benefit, then I think uh, a peace is going to be preserved. And so I think uh, uh, one of the important thing is uh, uh, having uh, a stable military balance uh, on the one hand, as well as uh, the prospect of uh, mutual prosperity uh, in the region. Uh, that are the conditions uh, of peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tanaka. Uh, it's a really very uh, fascinating uh, session, your uh, lecture and the question and answer session. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Ambassador uh, Naoki Ito uh, to kindly uh, provide uh, his remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joshi uh, for uh, moderating uh, this very, very engaging uh, discussions uh, between Professor Tanaka and those participants from North South University and other uh, institutions. I really would like to extend my sincere gratitude to North South University, uh, especially SIPZ for organizing and hosting uh, this uh, lecture. And I would like to thank uh, those who uh, joined us uh, through uh, this uh, live uh, broadcast uh, uh, session of today's uh, lecture. And my special thanks, of course, go to President and Professor Tanaka for having agreed to speak before the learned audience. And the purpose of holding a lecture is to provide Japan's perspective on issues of mutual uh, interest. I'm sure that the participants learned a lot uh, through the lecture by and interaction with uh, President Tanaka uh, today. And it would be my pleasure if participants deepened their understanding on Japan's views on Indo-Pacific and the importance of the partnership with uh, Japan. Uh, as Professor Tanaka said, uh, he came to Bangladesh in 2014 as JICA president and gave lecture at Dhaka University. And the theme then and theme today are very much uh, related. So I'm so uh, pleased and I'm so uh, gratified that uh, Professor Tanaka has been keeping his rather strong interest on the development of uh, Bangladesh, as well as the stability of this entire uh, region. And Professor Tanaka uh, claimed that copyright of Indo-Pacific uh, belongs to him. 
So uh, today is a very, very important uh, lecture that we should be more aware of the fact that it was Professor Tanaka who really initiated uh, this uh, now rather well-known vision of free and Indo, a free and open uh, Indo-Pacific. I think significance of today's lecture is that uh, Professor Tanaka focused on the resurgence of the Indo-Pacific, also uh, geopolitical or uh, changing geopolitical uh, situation uh, here. And so that uh, uh, the listeners awareness on the situation is rather uh, enhanced. Uh, if I may add, the timing of the lecture coincides with the closing moment of the nation's mourning months. So the father of the nation, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and his family were brutally killed on the 15th of August, 1975. So I would offer my deep respect to this. And I would like to say that two years before the, that, Bongo Bondu visited Japan in October, 1973. And during his visit to Japan, Bongo Bondu said at the Japan uh, Press Club that, I quote, we want Southeast Asia as a peaceful region. We have declared that the Indian Ocean region must be a free and peaceful region. We want peace only for the development of these regions, end quote. So almost 50 years ago, Bongo Bondu talked about the importance of freedom and peace in Indian Ocean, not in the Pacific, but Indian Ocean. But of course, the international environment at that time was uh, different. But nevertheless, I think it is important uh, to be reminded that Bongo Bondu uh, is emphasized the importance of the openness and peace, uh, free freedom and peace of the uh, oceanic part of this region. And I would say that his line of thought has uh, some relevance under uh, the current uh, changing uh, geopolitical uh, environment. And I would say it is rather at least interesting that Japan is now really trying to promote free and open Indo-Pacific uh, vision after 50 years of Bongo Bondu's remark. And of course, this vision is to pursue peace, stability, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, many people talked about the Matabari Deep Seaport. Yes, Matabari Deep Seaport is very, very important, uh, not only for the development of Bangladesh, but for the enhancement of connectivity, as well as uh, stability or stable development of the entire region. And Matabari is now uh, being developed for coal-fired power uh, station, as well as the first uh, stage of Deep Seaport by 2025, as Professor mentioned. Then uh, they are going to expand the port uh, to install LNG terminal, LPG terminal, so that Matabari will become energy hub uh, by, I would say, uh, 2030 or 2031. And beyond that, the next decade, uh, they will develop Matabari so that the handling capacity of cargo in Matabari will exceed that of uh, Chittagong. Then Matabari will be uh, functioning in a full-fledged manner so that Matabari will become energy hub, industrial hub, and all sorts of uh, connectivity will be coming out of uh, Matabari. Professor Tanaka mentioned the importance of seeking the possible cooperation in Bay of Bengal with uh, China. Uh, sometimes I looked at the uh, news report, uh, which talks about the fast track projects of Bangladesh, 10 projects, 12 projects, so and uh, now I, I would say that Japan and China are vying with each other in terms of the number of mega uh, projects, which are very, very important for Bangladesh. So in a way, Bangladesh is really trying to uh, seek and seize the opportunities uh, so that uh, those developing partners uh, will be able to provide cooperation and financing opportunities uh, for the purpose of uh, development of uh, Bangladesh. So I do really hope that the Japan will continue to be play an important role for the development of Matabari, a development of various projects on uh, Big B uh, initiatives. And in that conjunction, I would uh, echo with what Professor said, the importance of Bangladesh not to be trapped 
uh, in these uh, uh, debt uh, issues. And debt sustainability is a very, very important factor to take into consideration, as well as the economically efficient project openness, as well as transparency of project formulation and so forth. I think that is a sort of footnote uh, we all need to aware of when you think about uh, our cooperation uh, from uh, various uh, countries. Uh, Professor uh, Ambassador Shahidul Hok talked about uh, Bangladesh being a player in the region. Uh, there, I would like to uh, mention my observation when I attended the twin celebrations back in March. That is, of course, celebration of 50 years of independence, as well as Bongo Bondu's birth uh, centenary. So you had wonderful celebration for 10 days and leaders of five uh, nations of neighboring countries uh, gathered here uh, in town for five days. So those 10 days, Dhaka was a center of regional diplomacy and main theme was regional connectivity, regional cooperation. So Bangladesh was clearly showing its leadership role uh, for the development of the region and the stability of the region, uh, only with a rapid economic development, as well as the recent political stability. Bangladesh was able to play that role. So Japan would like to cooperate and help Bangladesh play more prominent role uh, in the re region, uh, particularly as a partner of pursuing this free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, before ending my uh, remarks, I briefly mentioned this Rohingya issue because some of the participants asked some question about Rohingya. Uh, yes, uh, Japan is willing to play a part even for the purpose of uh, repatriation of those uh, people uh, from uh, Bangladesh to uh, Myanmar, because repatriation is on, pr will provide only lasting uh, solutions to this issue. And finding lasting solutions is very important for the long-term stability of the region. And in light of the situation in Afghan, so we have some concern that uh, this uh, Rohingya uh, population might become rather uh, destabilizing force uh, towards the future. So we really need to step up our cooperation uh, to humanitarian assistance, as well as our effort uh, to uh, raise the issue, the important issue of repatriation uh, to the uh, Myanmar military. Although the current situation doesn't really allow us to have a meaningful dialogue uh, with Myanmar, but this is a very, very uh, important issue for uh, all of us. Uh, let me end by uh, saying that uh, earlier this year, the University of Tokyo set up an office in Dhaka, supported by Japanese education ministry, MEXT. Uh, the, the office also represents the interest of other Japanese universities in offering places for students and exchanging faculties and students. Uh, I know of Professor Tanaka as the executive vice president of the University of Tokyo, worked very hard for academic exchanges between Japan and India through establishing the university's regional office in uh, New Delhi about uh, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, maybe. So I hope today's lecture will be a stepping stone for developing our partnership in higher education with the strong involvement of North South University. I would like to reiterate my sincere gratitude to North South University for hosting today's event. Uh, let us continue our collaboration and dialogue uh, towards the future. Thank you uh, very much for wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, he, uh, Your Excellency uh, 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 Naoki Ito. And uh, we are really grateful uh, for, uh, you know, co-hosting this uh, uh, timely event. And as you said, actually dialogues, knowledge sharing, and uh, academic exchanges between Bangladesh and uh, Japan uh, are really vital for further uh, promoting the comprehensive uh, partnership uh, we have uh, already established. So before I uh, request uh, the chair of the session, uh, Professor Atikul Islam, I would like to request uh, Ambassador Shredul Hawk just uh, 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 kindly uh, uh, say a few words uh, 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 on the uh, total uh, program and discussion. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, uh, 
uh, Professor and President Tanaka for uh, your presentation and also for generating so much of a comment and discussion and thoughts. Um, so, so uh, you know, often we say that what is my takeaway from from these two hours of uh, uh, of my time. So I I have a couple of takeaway. I will quickly go through it, and I I'm sure that these takeaways could be others as well. That Bay of Bengal has again emerged as an important geopolitical and geoeconomical mm -hmm. entity. So that that's the reality that we need to look at from the foreign policy side. But it continues to remain fluid and uncertain, you know, because because of reasons. Uh, big power rivalry is one of those reasons which making us little uncomfortable and adding risks uh, to the potential that we all can rip out of it. Aspiring powers always uh, um, creates uh, difficulties for non-aspiring powers. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the hypothesis. Second is that cooperation and not confrontation should be the preferred pathways. Uh, for a uh, smaller nation, including for Bangladesh. And that's what our prime minister has always been uh, promoting. Uh, there are new alliances, both uh, in terms of geopolitics and uh, geoeconomics emerging. Uh, Bangladesh, as I uh, read from outside, looking at all possibilities and would only uh, prioritize in terms of its own realities and, and challenges. So that's, uh, that came out very strongly with Professor Mustafi's uh, and with uh, with uh, with uh, Secretary Koshet. Uh, Japan is a reliable and time-tested friend uh, that uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Ambassador Ito has rightly pointed out, how our, our uh, father of the nation, Bongabundu, attached huge importance in back in 1973. It's very clear. Uh, so here we have a reliable partner and, and there's no irritation in the relationship. And that's very important. You know, when we were talking about uh, uh, this uh, Matarbari project, uh, uh, we had a very open discussions and initially Bangladesh had wanted to know little more into the uh, future of the Matarbari. And that didn't create an irritation that enhanced the trust and understanding. And I, I'm sure that one day someone will write about that, uh, that period. Um, it's time for, uh, for Bangladesh to revisit some of the assumptions because some of the assumptions are no longer uh, relevant uh, and uh, a new strategy needs to be looked at. And as uh, Professor uh, Taufik has rightly pointed out, and I'm sure that Vice Chancellor will, will bring it back, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, university is uh, expanding its SIPG into an Asia study center where there will be area studies included. Uh, uh, so, so we will look forward to anchor uh, some of the discussions that we held today. But thank you, um, Ambassador Ito, and in particular, Professor uh, and President Tanaka uh, for your very insightful uh, presentation on the future of Bay and Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Shredul Hawk. Uh, now I would like to request uh, the chair of the session uh, Professor Atikul Islam, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of North South University, to provide uh, his uh, valuable remarks. Sir, so floor is here. Ambassador Naoki Ito, Ambassador of Sri Lanka, I suppose uh, I didn't get his full name, Ambassador Susan of Sri Lanka, or keynote speaker. Akihiko Tanaka, Professor Akihiko Tanaka, I must say, Ambassador Sheridan Hawk. I understand our ambassador, Bangladesh ambassador of, uh, in Australia, uh, also has joined us, uh, Professor Mustafa Zirohman, other contributors and participants. Um, look, uh, this SIPG has a tendency to put me in deep water every time, uh, asking me to talk on issues about which I know nearly nothing. Um, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to North South University. It is, I think we are the only university, or, or the probe is the, um, uh, most active university 
in the areas of international developments to have uh, seminars, workshops, and webinars from time to time. Uh, and a lot of credit goes to Professor Sheikh Kofi and his SIPG and the support that he gets from Professor Shoydul Hawk and others. Um, and this one is no exception. Uh, let me put my, uh, you know, uh, two words for what they're worth. As I understand, the Bay of Bengal touches Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, uh, and northern parts of Malaysia. It forms the northeastern part of the Indian Ocean. Its area is 2,172,000 uh, square kilometers. The average depth uh, in the bay is about 8,500 square feet. Uh, I think at the deepest point, it goes to about 15,000. Uh, it's a very resourceful place uh, with uh, gas, petroleum, fish, and other valuable marine resources. Bangladesh has been very successful in negotiating our sovereignty over the area of Bay of Bengal that should come to us. And I must congratulate the, our diplomatic team and our naval team, Admiral uh, uh, those here. Uh, for success there. But Bangladesh has not been that successful in developing and exploiting uh, those resources in the Bay of Bengal. Um, there's also, again, in, in the development and managing and exploiting of those resources, we will need the technology uh, from our friends such as Japan and other countries. And this is very timely uh, that Professor Tanaka has given us some ideas as to the direction that we could take. Of course, he comes from a uh, Japanese perspective as a patriot, uh, but we value his opinion so much. Now, there are concerns about uh, the environment that is prevailing and the waves going in the Bay of Bengal. So these concerns are uh, about the dolphins, about the tunas, about the turtles. There are also some concerns about the world's largest mangrove that borders the uh, uh, Bay of Bengal, the Sundarbans. There must be concerns because 31% of the world's fishermen live on uh, the Bay of Bengal and they work in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, so the pollution that's going on there, the plastics that's creating a nuisance, the nets that uh, results in killing of uh, unwanted fish uh, species, all those problems are present there and we must be careful about uh, those also. Uh, Overfishing is another problem. Although we have a huge area, I don't think we can even fish enough. There must be planned fishing, not whoever can pirate whatever from there, because Bangladesh has a weak Navy uh, and some other countries have very sly uh, fishing boats. So we must be careful about uh, those aspects. Also, politically, there are some difficulties. India tends to consider it as if it's their backwaters, uh, it's their pond uh, behind the house sort of thing almost. And then you have the uh, problem of China becoming increasingly assertive and interested. Uh, what is also uh, almost likely is that the, the politics of South China Sea uh, might get linked with the politics of Bay of Bengal. In that case, you will have the oversensitive Chinese uh, sort of uh, diplomats and uh, politicians trying to, I don't know what policy they will take. Uh, for example, you know, uh, you know, yeah, they will basically 
say, should anyone join the quad or should we stay put where we are? Bilateral individual negotiations where, uh, where they are uh, very um, proficient in putting pressure on you. Uh, for example, uh, the new tariff on the Australian products such as beef and other things, wine, etc., uh, because of Australia joining uh, uh, the, the 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 chorus for investigating the source, the original source of COVID-19, or maybe even the quad, I don't know. So there are some issues. We need friendship with all. We need India. We need China. We need Japan. We need the United States. So that will provide our diplomats like our next diplomats like Shari uh, with a very high um, tightrope to walk on. And I'm sure they have been balancing for the 50 years. So they're good at the act and they will manage it somehow. Um, I am not an expert in the area, so I won't venture any more comments. Let me finish by thanking Ambassador Naoki Ito for giving so much of time. It's so generous of him. And I would like to thank once again our keynote uh, speaker, uh, Akihiko, Professor Akihiko Tanaka. He was fabulous. And uh, let me thank also SIPG and all the participants once again. And we will see you in various forums of North South from time to time. Um, that's it from me. Thank you all once again. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for your uh, very fascinating uh, uh, speech. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Ambassador Ito, Prof. Satanaka. Uh, all the Japanese uh, staffs uh, who help us to organize this event and uh, the uh, dignitaries and all the participants. Still, I see the huge number of participants are, uh, uh, you know, still there. So um, uh, I, apology, uh, I apologize uh, for not getting all the questions uh, raised because of the time constraint. Uh, so thank you very much for all of your uh, participation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah.